Hi everybody, this is Joshua Kirk back with you guys once again. And now it's time for part 2 of episode 20 of Album of the Day. In which uh, I'm going to be reviewing Stephen Kellogg's most recent solo album which came out on June 19th, 2013. Blunderstone Rookery. And uh, the album... Uh, uh, I know all of you are wondering why I'm doing a part two here of this review. The reason for that is because at the end of part one, the battery cut off, so I decided that I wanted to do a part two in which I'm just going to go right into the music, but first I also forgot to mention in part one that, like, uh, in the inside of the packaging of the album, and on the... Um, and in the booklet, in like the thank you section of the album, um, it says, All Love Futures Bright, which obviously was the name that the tour that Stephen Kellogg has been doing lately, All Love Futures Bright tour, was named after. And, uh, I also would like to mention some of the assistant engineers that are on the album, too. They include... Chip Johnson, um, um, I remember Chip Johnson is one of them, uh, but let me just look in the, uh, booklet for, uh, this album. Um, uh, I already showed you this booklet, so I don't need to go into too much detail about it. Uh, the, ins the assistant engineers are Chip Johnson, Mike Getz, Sean Watkins, Thad Beatty, Travis McNabb, Jerry DePizzo, Luke Brindley, and Kit Carlson. There's the last two pages real quick. Let me show you the CD again. There it is. Uh, there's the uh, inside of the album again, just uh, giving you a preview of that right there. Um, so um, let's uh, talk about, uh, here's uh, part two of my review of Stephen Kellogg's album, Blunderstone Rookery, in which you may remember I already talked about the early Fleetwood Mac sort of sound of the first track on the record, Lost and Found, which is a great opener to start out with something a little more laid back, mellow, and relaxing on here before Stephen Kellogg puts in those rock in the heck out sort of moments. Uh, and uh, thankfully enough, thank God he uh, puts in some energy on the uh, on the second track on the album, which I already mentioned, The Brain is a Beautiful Thing, which is sort of of like this gritty rock and roll bar room slash barrel house sort of feel kind of reminds me a little bit of Billy Joel like it doesn't exactly reminisce on Billy Joel nor does it rip off Billy Joel either but I think it sort of sounds like that so it's an awesome song in my opinion and then um Uh, you know, just getting my thoughts together here for for part two. Um, where we last left off was on track number three on the album, which is a song called Forgive You, Forgive Me, which, as I mentioned before, it definitely does sound as if, like, if there were, if there was another single off of the album, this song would be it. It definitely does, it definitely does sound uh, radio ready for sure. It sounds ready for some radio station. Not that same old, uh, boring, um, rather boring, uh, same old top 40 poppy radio station that you might hear in your local country, but just the good, like, 
alternative rock slash alternative pop slash indie rock slash indie pop sort of station, sort of an indie alternative, sort of an alternative indie rock and pop station is what I would call that. Um, like, the reason for that is because, uh, you know, it's definitely got some great guitars and great, uh, drums, not like the banging beats that you hear on the radio, but just, I think it sounds catchy enough for a radio station, a uh, nice bass line in there, along with, uh, some rather joyous piano in the background, too, um, and lyrically, it's, and, uh, the chorus is nice and catchy, catchy enough for a radio station, for sure, and, uh, the song lyrically is a song that I think we should all connect to, because the song, um, has a lyric in it, you can't win and you may lose, but if you forgive me, I'll forgive you, um, like, I can easily relate to that, it's, a s songs about forgiveness can get a little cheesy sometimes, but this song, on the other hand, is an, is an exception. And the background vocals on it, I will admit, are just excellent. Track number four is a song called Men and Women. And let me say, and let me just say, I love this song, and my mom loves this song, too. We both absolutely think it's a standout highlight. Like, you know, great to hear my mom, great to hear my mom, you know, agreeing with, uh, me on here, so, so, you know, if you're watching, Mom, this is for you, um, the song is a lot more laid back, mellow, and relaxing, sort of like the really mellow opener, Lost and Found, um, and, uh, like, with just two acoustic guitars, bass, drums, a banjo, a rather liberal tambourine, like, not like a crazy tambourine, but like, you know, uh, just, a tambourine that definitely does remind me of old school bluegrass, along with a chord organ, which is played by Kit Carlson playing in the background. Sounds pretty nice, too. Sounds pretty neat for the song. But lyrically, it's a song that I think we should also relate to, because it's a song about um, how we all need a little bit of a uh, man in the heart of a woman and a little bit of woman in the heart of a man. Uh, like, you know, lyrically, that song is definitely great, because one of the things I love about Stephen Kellogg is the fact that he writes a lot of songs that I connect to really easily, that feel like songs that are about me, pretty much, so, and it's not surprising, because I am going to be meeting Stephen Kellogg and seeing him in concert soon, so I uh, can't wait to see you, Stephen Kellogg, because I know you'll get along great with me. Um... Track number five is a song called Crosses, which is the main single from the album, I think, because this was released on a 7-inch, I think, with Thanksgiving on the B-side, probably. I think Thanksgiving is actually on a 7-inch with Crosses on the B-side, but Thanksgiving definitely isn't the first single off of the album. In fact, it's a 10-minute track, which I'll talk about soon, because that song is awesome, in my opinion. Um... Uh, this song definitely does bring out the folky Americana alt-country sort of vibe that he's been known for for well over um, his whole career, like from the days when very few people knew about him to when he started getting popular with the self-titled Stephen Kellogg and the Sixers album. Um, and uh, this song uh, is sort of a song about it's, like, dedicated to all those people that have, like, braved or, like, survived car accidents that they've been involved in. Um, and definitely this bring out some of those, some of that all-country instrumentation in with a bunch of acoustic guitars, one in which is played by, <coughs> um, one of the guitars is which played by Sean Watkins bass, drums, uh, pedal steel, uh, two mandolins, one played by Brian Dolly and the other one played by Sam Getz, who is the Sixers lead guitarist, um, uh, the tambourine in there, which sounds pretty nice, uh, the fiddle played by, uh, Bean, Ben Dean, and, uh, some Rhodes bells and percussion from Kit Carlson, which, sort of add sort of the pop edge to it, but not like crazy pop, but like, 
you know, just definitely does I have the pop hookiness to it, so I'm pretty sure that this would fit on an alt country Americana folky station, like, you know, not like that poppy country station, because in my opinion, country music is getting a little too s sticky sweet, a little cheesy, and get turning into, like, the same thing for me nowadays, but, you know, if there's, like, any, like, good classic country Americana station, this song definitely has to be played on there, has to, um, because, you know, it sounds great for a single. Track number six is a song called I Don't Want to Die in the Road, which is a song which is more of the big ballad of the whole album. Uh, you can see why. It opens with just Stephen Kellogg's voice over Kit Carlson playing this rather melancholy yet pretty hopeful piano line. Uh, and lyrically, it's a song which is pretty much the same concept as Crosses. Not as catchy, but definitely it's the same concept. Because both of those songs are about two things, lyrically. Death and Roads. And this one is definitely, like, sort of the continuum of the writing concept of the song Crosses. Um, like, you know, it sort of talks about how, he's talking about how, he's talking about all these rock stars that he cares a whole lot about. Like, you know, he pretty much cares, cares, uh, uh, pretty much cares the heck out of these artists, um, uh, and mentions how it took a while, but finally, f but finally he found the truth, um, which, you know, is a pretty hopeful line, it sort of tells you that this song can be a little melancholy, uh, at first, but I feel like as you listen to that lyric and listen closely to some of the other lyrics in the song, you, you'll notice how hopeful it is, um, and, uh, then it slowly starts to build up. There's the bass and the drums coming in, along with Stephen Kellogg's acoustic guitar and some beautiful string arrangements, like Sarah Whitney playing those really yeah, sorrowful uh, yet beautiful um, uh, violins and violas, violas. Uh, and Lauren Dickinson laying down that rather melancholy yet really pretty cello line on here, along with Rachel. Beauregard, I don't know how to pronounce her last name, um, uh, doing these really angelic background vocals by the bridge where, uh, he, uh, mentions, you know, all the rock stars that he's about to talk about that, it's not really his name today, but, like, uh, other rock stars out there, uh, how, and it sort of tells you that rock and roll can save, that if rock and roll can save your soul, it's also going to take its toll, uh, and you give a lot of this, and uh, I give this a lot. Um, Buddy Holly, Stevie Ray, Harry J, Jim Crochet, uh, but not my name today. Um, like, I feel like Rachel's background vocals really do fit in the song. Um, song, um, uh, like, uh, having sort of an angel background voice in there, um, and plus, uh, and, uh, the song definitely does mention one, uh, writing concept of a song that I think we can pretty much all relate to, the fact that, um, the last place that we want our lives to end is on the road, uh, like, and I'm talking like, just like Stephen Kellogg is in the song, I'm talking like some place that's far away from your home, cause, you know, Cause you know, one thing's true. Where you're born is where is where you're gonna die. That's for sure. It can be a little hard to listen to sometimes for some listeners, but I feel like as those listeners who think this song uh, is boring on the first listen, I feel like if they just listen to it more, I think they sort of realize how emotional and how hopeful the song can be too, as well as melancholy, like. It definitely has a powerful feeling that pretty much, you know, puts all your thoughts away to the side and just replaces them with just focusing on the song, sort of pay, paying attention to its concept. So, you know, it's a pretty long story about I Don't Want to Die on the Road, but, you know, it's a pretty, it's a pretty great song. It's definitely a standout for sure, so that's why I'm 
having a pretty long story about the song sort of speechifying here. Track number seven is a song called Good Old Days, which once again sort of sounds like a gritty rock and roll barroom slash barrel house sort of groove, sort of reminiscent of Billy Joel, but yet not really ripping off him. Because, you know, ripping off someone can, you know, upset a lot of people, but, you know, great that, you know, he's trying to make more sounds. That, eh, but I think it's great that Stephen Kelly is trying to make more songs that sound like something from the 80s or something. And this song is just that. And it's a song about just looking back and saying that that there were our good old days right there. Um, the uh, song, um, like, you know, it sort of mentions that, like, on the second verse especially, I think, when he mentions the two lines, kicking and scratching, got a Gibson and a Root, a few songs, I'm where I belong own part of a house, have a pretty wife and a few kids, growing up strong, uh, like, and, you know, and he feels like he he's only, when he, and he feels like he's only just begun in the music business, even though there's a bunch of people out there, you know, saying the music business is all done when it's not really true, and, and he's talking about selling records for a couple of bucks, and, you know, if you could play guitar, you could get a girl, and, um, and he just, uh, and, uh, he says that, you know, they can have, uh, the records for free, uh, if that wasn't enough for them. And, uh, musically, the song is pretty top-notch quality, like, pretty awesome drum and tambourine sort of work on here. Um, some rather, you know, uh, kick butt, um, uh, acoustic and electric guitar work. Uh, a really cool bass line on here for from Chip Johnson, um, sort of the barroom, barrel house, sort of gritty piano in the background, it's definitely there, along with a Clarence Clemens inspired saxophone solo from Jerry DePizzo. Uh, like, I don't know if uh, he was listening to some uh, Clarence Clemens uh, sax solos before the recording of this one, or if he was just inspired by those. But it definitely does sound inspired by Clarence Clemens for sure. Uh, so, so kudos to him for making just some awesome collaborations or contributions to uh, the album. Like on the like on the brain is a beautiful thing and good old days. Hey, let me say this: May Clarence Clemens uh, rest in peace up there in heaven. Like I will admit that. Um, and plus there's some really joyous vocal work, you know, really passionate lead vocals from Stephen Kellogg, uh, and, and it feels the same way on Chip Johnson's harmony vocals on here too, um, along with really just cheerful and happy backup vocals, uh, vocals uh, like belting sort of style, and the vocals coming from, um, uh, uh, a few people, uh, which are, like, a few of his friends, I think, pretty much. Uh, Brian Dolly, uh, Rachel Beauregard, and, uh, Annie Clements, I feel like, is the third one. Because the first two backing vocalists on the song that I mentioned are, uh, Brian Dolly and Rachel, Rachel Beauregard from Native Run. Uh, even though I don't know what projects Annie Clements has sang in, but... You know, just an excellent song, an absolute powerhouse, in my opinion. Track 8 is a song called Good Red Wine, which is a debut featuring female singer Audra May. And believe me, this is the first time I've ever heard of her, and plus heard her voice. And I will admit, her voice is really pretty. I think it really complements and It's a nice balance uh, with Stephen Kellogg. Sort of like a salad, where, you know, this salad has to have a nice balance with the dressing instead of, you know, just overwhelming, e instead of overwhelming each other things. And this song is a great tempo change, I'll give you that. Um, it, uh, like, has sort of a, um, um, it definitely has that alt-country feel once again, uh, along with, um, um, it, there's an interesting tempo change on this song. 
starts out like, like a slower song, so I expected the song to be sort of like that the whole time. And then the tempo changed, and and then it just turns into like this really just this catchy song, not too too catchy, so that way you don't know what you're listening to. But I definitely do applaud Stephen Kellogg for trying a different tempo change for this song. Like I can totally imagine, like I can totally imagine this song probably started out as just a slow song the whole time, and then they recorded it, and the other musicians were probably like. Make it faster, make it catchy, make it amazing. Is I think that's probably what all the producers and musicians and people like and people like that were probably all like. So that's pretty much what they did. So and a really great guitar solo uh, from Sam Getz along with really top notch piano work from Kit Carlson. Like I will admit, Kit Carlson really nailed it on this one. Uh, as far as production goes and as far as, you know, his really just uh, excellent piano playing, piano and keyboard playing on this album goes, goes like a, like you know he's a really talented dude. So so I applaud him for his production on here, here for making it sound great. Track number nine is called the best, and this song uh, starts out with a little with a funny little intro. Um, soon after uh. Good Red Wine, which is almost like a five-minute song. There's like a 22-second break afterwards, uh, playing into the best, where it's like Stephen Kellogg talking, like saying, Death is by Foxes, which eventually becomes a line in the song Thanksgiving, and uh, then mentions uh, the chorus uh, in here. But then eventually it uh, plays into the actual song, which does... Feature little voices from Stephen Kellogg in there is credited in the liner notes. Um, liner notes. And, uh, the song, uh, you know, starts out with this little, like, uh, marching band drum roll thing. Uh, but then eventually it starts, but then eventually it turns into a song sounding sort of like something I would hear in, like, an Irish pub or, like, a dance bar or something like that. Thing like that. Uh, like, you can hear that just by listening to the acoustic guitar, the piano, uh, the, the really kick-butt drum work from, uh, Kit Carlson on here, um, so on here along with just, you know, some rather, you know, sort of grimy sounding lead vocals from Stephen Kellogg along with the harmony vocals from Chip Johnson, uh, this, and of course, uh, there are two other interesting thing of, things in this song. Um, Stephen Kellogg is laying down that nasty slide guitar on the best, which I'm pretty sure it was fun recording that. And there's a blaring French horn in the background, too. Um, and uh, then once you get to the bridge, it says the words, like, there's all these different Stephen Kellogg voices with sort of this echoey reverb sort of feel to them, saying... No, I won't settle. No, I won't settle. No, I won't settle. I still believe. Um, and then all these sounds of like church bells and stuff sampled by Kit Carlson. But then after that funny little like psychedelic rock sort of bridge there, where the drums uh, drop out, about with just a little bit of guitars and piano and keyboards uh, still there and percussion too. Uh, Next, after that funny little bridge, comes my favorite lyric on the album, which goes, Some days are like candy, some like refried beans, some days is relentless and drill sergeant me, but if you've got your health and your soul still intact, that's as good as the best day that you'll ever have. Like, uh, this song definitely does have great humor to it, I will admit that. But there are a few like fun lyrics in there. Uh, yet, it's definitely a great song that... Uh, I can connect to very easily, like, uh, and it has that catchy little chorus that, uh, is spoken by Stephen Kellogg on that funny little intro that isn't really a part of the song, but, like, uh, it's like, uh, during, like, the end of Good Red Wine, the little, uh, after, like, the four minute and 52 second track Good Red Wine, there's, uh, the 22 second, um, uh, break with like 
him uh, uh, speak in that catchy chorus, which goes, you get what you pay for, and sometimes it's bad. Uh, bad. If you look around, there I, there I, there are ideas to be had. Just trying to say it like correctly, but I'd rather hold out for the best of the best than sit around hedging my bets with the rest. Like this song is definitely a highlight. So, good job, Stephen Kellogg. Uh, track number ten is the gem of the whole album, which is Thanksgiving. And let me say. This song is definitely the one standout track for sure, and it, and I bet it is the standout track for pretty much anybody else who's heard the album. It starts out with a gospel choir, which is the University of Massachusetts choral, you know, singing that uh, beginning, and then coming in there's the acoustic guitar and a little bit of keyboards in the background. Coming in is Stephen Kellogg's voice, and he starts, you know, talking about Pa the past and like, and this song is sort of like on a journey. So hopefully, when all of you were about to hear this song, you were ready for the emotional roller coaster that he's sort of going on on here. Uh, like starting with I recollect the the rose of Sharon had come back again, and the trees were blown in the breeze all b high above my head. Uh, like you know, just starting out with those words. So it starts, you know, keeps getting better and better, and soon coming in is the is the haunting line of death is by foxes, um, and uh, there's a nice little chorus in there, um, this in there, like you know, America, this is home, stories, everybody's got one and stuff, and I bet this song was probably the most fun to record on the album too, in fact. There's a lot of different instruments on here. Acoustic and electric guitars, bass, piano, keyboards, drums, percussion, pedal steel in the background, banjo, um, a brass section and a string section, and a little bit of background vocals here and there from the University of Massachusetts choral. Um, but I will admit, by the end, this is the point where, like, where I will tell you this, Stephen Kelly, this song moved me to tears. Literally, there, my eyes weren't really wet when I heard it, but I nearly cried happy tears. It was so good, um, especially by the end where he's where he started, you know, getting all, you know, emotional and almost tearful in there. Like uh, when you're like mentioning all the powerful things where, you know, if everybody hung out with their friends instead of doing all those crimes and death and stuff. Um, like, I like how the song sort of turns from, like, sort of, uh, sort of a happy go luck sort of song about life, and then eventually goes into, like, a more powerful, more emotional, almost, uh, like, really moving, uh, melancholy song, uh, with, um, talking about, like, sorrow and death and stuff like that. And then, of course, it closes out with the University of Massachusetts choral, uh, playing, uh, uh, singing the, uh, final verse in the song, uh, and it's sort of a long 10-minute track, but I will admit this, I applaud you, Stephen Kellogg, for making this song longer than five minutes on here, because it really needs to be in order to resonate with the listener, in my opinion. Uh, the closing track on here is track 11, and it's called Ingrid Song, and, uh, I originally thought, um, I didn't even know that um, Stephen Kellogg had another daughter, daughter Greta, until I read the liner notes of the album. Uh, but for some reason, what's weird is that he doesn't have a song. He hasn't written a song for her, so there's like he hasn't written a song for her yet. But hopefully, on the next album, he'll try to write you know just a beautiful song for her. Cause trust me, her her daughter. Her daughter's names are adorable, as well as her look with the pretty hair. They're just, they're really cute daughters, in my opinion. Uh, Ingrid's song is a song that was uh, dedicated um, to uh, his late mother-in-law, Ingrid Caffrey, who passed away, who, like, was born in 1943 and was, like, a really close family member to, um, to, 
to uh, Stephen Kellogg, but then she died in uh, uh, 2012. But I feel like this is a great dedica dedication for her with this beautiful acoustic guitar playing. And then coming in on the bridge, there's definitely some interesting additions in there. There's a little, like, uh, 80s sort of synthesizer thing coming in in the background, not like a crazy synthesizer like what you hear in pop music on the radio today, but uh, there's this nice little like 80s sort of synthesizer line. Stephen Kellogg's playing that really beautiful melancholy harmonica line. And then coming in, there's a brass section which features... Kit Carlson playing tuba, uh, which of course he also does that on Thanksgiving, but he doesn't right here an Ingrid song. So I have a feeling it's a great way to close the album, something a little more chill and a little more emotional. Like the the reason I was talking quite a bit about the lyrics is because I think this I think these songs lyrically definitely are excellent songs in my opinion. Uh, like, their lyrics definitely have this great a attention to detail. And I almost forgot to mention that Good Red Wine is excellent lyrics of how you never dare to ask sometimes. Um, and also it's a great finale with him closing out with that rather emotional, uh, beautiful dedication number, Ingrid song. Um, song. Uh, this album, production-wise, is top-notch. Lyrically, it's top-notch. Vocally, it's top-notch. And musically, it's definitely nothing short of awesome right there. Um, there, like, I love how... I've, I've read some reviews of the album that were great. Uh, a lot of people mention that they've sat down, like, like, even the snottiest... They said even the snottiest music listeners listened to this album and really loved it a lot. Like, it's great to hear all these people are... Uh, sitting down some snotty music listeners with this album, and yet uh, those people aren't going to, you know, say, you know, some rather strong negative things about the album. They're just going to appreciate it and pay attention to it pretty well, so I think it's excellent. Like, I'm, me personally, I'm definitely not a snotty music listener, but I still enjoy this album, nonetheless. I give it a 10 out of 10, for sure. Um... Now, uh, I'm hoping you uh, enjoyed this review, and uh, stay tuned for episode 21.